Uh, this will be the 21st year that we've been gathering, and we, we enjoy uh, being up in this area. Let's pray together. We're going to shift our gears now and take a look uh, at one who was called the great commoner. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to give you thanks for the wonderful time of fellowship we've had with one another in the Word, fellowship with one another uh, in the Gospel, mutually encouraging one another, being iron, sharpening iron to one another in these, in these hours we've been together. And Lord, those of us who are pastors are gripped when we're reminded that our Savior, some of His last words to His under-shepherds, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And we want to be found faithful in that task. And we're grateful we have a heritage of godly men who've gone before us, paved the way, left for us a wonderful example. So as we study the life, labors, legacy of John brought us tonight, help us to glean from this. And, and remember that he was, when all is said and done, simply a sinner saved by grace, but one, one on whom you laid your hand in a marvelous and a mighty way. So help us to learn tonight the things you would have us to learn. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In 1895, the Southern Baptist Con Convention celebrated its 50th anniversary and did so in the city of Washington, D.C. Interestingly enough, the Protestant churches in D.C. opened up their pulpits to some of the leading Southern Baptist pastors so that in Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches all across the city, Southern Baptists were preaching in their pulpits on that, the Sunday leading up to the annual meeting. In the midst of the convention, Dr. W.H. Whitsett, president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, gave an address entitled, A Retrospect. It was a survey of the first 50 years of the Southern Baptist denomination. His concluding words hint at the vision which early Southern Baptists entertained for their convention of churches. Listen to what he said. When the convention was holding its opening session in Augusta, there was a lad just turned 18 years resting under the quiet shades of Culpeper in far distant Virginia. He was unknown to fame. Possibly no member of the body had ever heard his name. In due time, he appeared upon the scene and for a period of 30 years played the role of our great commoner. For 30 years, he was the leading force in our councils in history. Yet throughout that entire period, he did not occupy the smallest office directly in the gist of the convention. This year of our jubilee, with all its life and gladness, has been sadly darkened by his departure. On the 17th of March, devout men carried him to his burial and made great lamentation over him. The foremost leader of our history, great in the might of his gentleness, has passed away from us. But his fame and his usefulness shall go and grow throughout the years and ages. When you who sit here shall be aged and feeble men and women, little children will gather about your knees with reverence and delight to look upon one who has seen and heard and spoken with John A. Broadus. The statement reflects the hope that those who were the founders of this denomination had for future generations. But where are we now? In 2007, a little over 100 years, 112 years since Whitsitt made these remarks. John Albert brought us remains a stranger to most Southern Baptists. And we are the poorer for that. The Broadus family, which originally the name Broadus was spelled with two D's, came to Green Island, Virginia in the early 1700s in the person of Edward Broadus, who was John Broadus' great-great-grandfather. 
He had come from a Welch family of Anglo-Saxon descent. The family name was originally Broadhurst, but it had become Anglicized and the Americanized, then Americanized to Broadus. The way that one D disappeared from the name, the story is told, is that an eccentric uncle decried the unnecessary use of letters. He saw the second D as serving no purpose, and so it was dropped. And though John Albert Broadus' side of the family followed this uncle's lead, not all of the Broadus clan did so. Dr. William F. Broadus, who was a pastor in Fredericksburg, Virginia, was in the process of a building program, and he told the young man in charge of building the pews to be sure and put on his pew the DD. This young man was aghast that the pastor would so flaunt his doctor of divinity that he did not even put the pastor's name on the pew. And it remained without a name until Dr. Broadus' meaning was clarified. John Broadus was born January 24, 1827, to Major Edmund Broadus and his wife Nancy Sims Broadus. John was the youngest of four children. James Madison, Martha, and Caroline were the three eldest siblings. James P. Boyce was born 13 days before John Broadus. They did not meet, however, until many years later. John Albert Broadus was named after two of his mother's brothers, John Sims, a doctor, and Albert Sims, a schoolteacher, who would make a tremendous mark upon the life of young John. When John Broadus was 15 years old, his uncle, William F. Broadus, wrote to Edmund, John's father, and said, then let's hope that someone in our family is destined to be a prodigy. And as our day is nearly past, take it for granted that the next generation will be favored with his presence. Sometime later, John's sister Martha wrote to one of her cousins saying, I think your little cousin John will be the brightest star of the Broadus family. At the age of five, John began his education under Mr. Albert Tutt, who had a field school. John became very proficient in spelling. From the age of eight, Broadus was taught at home under the tutelage of his sister Martha. Under her instruction, he became a tremendous reader. His sister exposed him to a great range of subjects, including religion. He began reading the Religious Herald during his childhood and continued this practice throughout his life. When John was 10 years old, his father, Major Edmund Broadus, opened a school and taught John for two years. In 1839, after his father returned to politics, John enrolled in a school taught by his uncle, Mr. Albert Sims, and it was under his leadership that John became an outstanding Latin scholar. Without a doubt, this proficiency opened to him the doors of other language study, chief among them being New Testament Greek. When visiting Europe many years later, John took the occasion while in Rome to write a letter in Latin to his uncle, uncle Albert, who responded in turn with his own letter written in Latin. John stayed under Mr. T Mr. Sims except for one year when it was necessary for him to manage the farm for a season. He graduated from Sims School at the age of 16, but without any fanfare. He simply arrived home one day with his trunk containing all his belongings. His father was alarmed by such an abrupt appearance and thought that perhaps John had been thrown out of school for being disobedient. So Edmund brought us checked into the matter with Albert Sims, who told him, quote, the boy has learned everything I can teach him. I can't teach him anymore. While John was still in school, a protracted meeting was conducted at Mount Pony Baptist Church in Culpeper Courthouse by Reverend Charles Lewis of Kentucky, along with the aid of Reverend Barnett Grimsley. At this meeting, John Broadus was converted. While under conviction and feeling unable to take hold of the promises of the Scripture concerning those who had come to Christ, a friend quoted him, John 6, 37, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Saying to John over and over, In no wise cast out, John. Can't you take hold of that? Indeed he did. As the light of heaven opened upon his soul and he was saved, seeing that Christ had died for him and called him unto himself. He was soon baptized in the membership of the Mount Pony Baptist Church and then shortly afterward moved his membership to the New Salem Church where his family attended. At the age of 17, Broadus began to, be, to teach as a tutor himself in the home of William Sowers at Rose Hill, Clark County, Virginia. He was a good teacher, though very young. The next year, he undertook a teaching assignment in Woodley, Virginia, staying part-time in the home of Dr. Llewellyn Kerfoot, the father of F.H. Kerfoot, who later became a great Southern Baptist theologian in his own right. It was F.H. Kerfoot, by the way, 
uh, in uh, the back of one of our uh, new convention normal manuals for Sunday school workers who made the observation discussing doctrines that nearly all Baptists hold in common, saying that nearly all Baptists believe what are commonly called the doctrines of grace. And that was printed in the early 1900s. It was during this period of John's life while making preparation to study medicine that God made clear to him that he was to give his life to preaching the gospel. In August of 1846, Dr. A.M. Poindexter came to the, the area. He preached on the parable of the talents. Years later, at Dr. Poindexter's funeral, Broadus told the story of his call to the ministry. He said, quote, Presently, he spoke of consecrating one's mental gifts and possible attainment to the work of the ministry. He seemed to clear up all difficulties pertaining to the subject. He swept away all the disguise of self-delusion, all the excuses of fancy humility. He held up the thought that the greatest sacrifices and toils possible to a minister's lifetime would be a hundredfold repaid if he should be the instrument of saving one soul. Doubtless the sermon had many more important results that had not been recorded. But when a break in the services came, young Broadus sought out his pastor and with choking voice said, Brother Grimsley, the question is decided. I must try to be a preacher. In the fall of 1846, Broadus entered the University of Virginia and established himself immediately as an outstanding scholar. He became one of the university's favorite sons. At various intervals throughout the rest of his life, he would be sought after by his alma mater to serve in one capacity or another. <coughs> Excuse me. One of his professors said to him, if genius is the ability and willingness to do hard work, Broadus was a genius. It was during his university career that he met Maria Harrison, daughter of Dr. Gessner Harrison, his favorite professor. He would go over to Harrison's home to visit his professor. And Maria would take long walks with him to help him improve his health. We've all heard those stories, haven't we? Their friendship blossomed into love, and they were married after brought us his graduation from the university. But it was during this time at the university that he faced a couple of major crises in his life. In June, at the end of his first year of studies, his mother died suddenly. He entered the bedroom of their home just in time to speak to her as she passed away. And then in June of 1850, two days prior to his graduation from the university, his father died. John was scheduled to deliver the valedictory address for his class, but instead he had to graduate in absentia, and the address was never given. But so powerful was the address that some of his peers and professors had it printed in the university magazine. And it was entitled, Human Society in its relation to natural theology. It was a tribute to the influence of Dr. William McGuffey, another one of John's professors and the author of the McGuffey Readers. November 13, 1850, John and Maria were married. Their union was blessed with three children, Eliza Somerville, Annie Harrison, and Mary Louisa Broadus. Mary Louisa died at less than four years of age. And before their seventh wedding anniversary... Mrs. Broadus died suddenly at the age of 26. For the next 15 months, John had various responsibilities as a pastor and a father without the comfort and help of a wife. Later, he married Charlotte Eleanor Sinclair, who became his companion throughout the remainder of his days. Five children were born to this union. Samuel Sinclair Broadus, who was known as S.S. Broadus, Boyce Broadus, Alice Virginia Broadus, Mellie Broadus, a child who died early in infancy. And then Ella Thomas Broadus, who would later marry Dr. A.T. Robertson. John Broadus wore many different hats in the course of his life's labors. I've already mentioned that he taught school. He served as a tutor in the home of General J.H. Cock of Virginia after his graduation from the university. He still was planning and working toward his call to the ministry and found that tutoring allowed him to spend a year studying at his own pace. Later on, when he was a professor in the seminary, he would often encourage his students who had opportunity to take a year off before they engaged themselves in their labors. He counseled young students planning to enter college to do the same. He said it was a very valuable year in his own life. In 1851, the opportunity came for him to pastor. 
He preached his first sermon on June 4, 1849 at the Mount Eagle Presbyterian Church to supply for Dr. William McGuffey. McGuffey had become ill and needed someone to supply on short notice, so he asked young Broadus. The college senior took the congregation by storm. He captured the hearts of the members of the Mount Eagle Church as they compared the young, fiery, eloquent Broadus, I would, I would say with no intention to offend my Presbyterian friends, the young, fiery, eloquent Baptist brought us with Dr. McGuffey, whose sermons were considered by many to be stale and predictable. In September 1851, Broadus was called to be the pastor of the Charlottesville Baptist Church. He accepted this call at a time when the University of Virginia was pleading with him to consider a teaching position. By taking the Charlottesville pastorate, Broadus knew that he could pastor the church and at the same time teach part-time as an instructor in Latin and Greek under his dear friend, Dr. Gessner Harrison. During the pastorate at Charlottesville, Broadus helped establish the Albemarle Family Institute. Pardon me, Albemarle Female Institute. It was the only one of its kind, and the young preacher brought to it some very interesting innovations in education. He and Professor Hart placed a high emphasis on piety at the institute, and there was one student who entered in 1857 who was particularly known for her devil-may-care attitude. Her name was Charlotte Diggs Moon. In December 1858, however, the prayers of Lottie Moon's Christian friends were answered. Broadus was holding a series of evangelistic meetings directed to the students in Charlottesville and a group of Albemarle Female Institute students held a Sunrise Inquiry meeting in support of the efforts. They were mentioning Lottie's name in prayer and to the girl's great surprise, Lottie attended the prayer meeting, got into an earnest private conversation with John Broadus. Soon after, she confessed Christ as her Lord and Savior and was baptized into the membership of the Charlottesville Baptist Church by Broadus himself. John Broadus had a tremendous impact on the life of Lottie Moon, and there's good reason, if you've read her biography, to believe that she shared similar theological convictions with the pastor who pointed her to the Savior. Broadus had a pastor's heart, though he often felt very inadequate for the task of shepherding the people of God. Once while on a journey away from his field of labor, he wrote to his wife, sharing with her his concerns for the congregation. See if you can identify with this, pastors. Oh, that I could see sinners among my people converted. It lies like a burden on my heart. The thought that there are so many unconverted men and women who look to me for almost their only instruction. So many on the road to hell with no voice but mine to warn them of their danger and invite them to Jesus. Alas, how cold have been my warmest feelings, how dull my most earnest appeals. The Lord in mercy forgive me that, that so often, so constantly I have neglected my duty. I know that I'm not fit to be the instrument of good. The Lord take me and fashion and temper me and then use me for His glory. Pray much for me that the love of Christ may subdue the deceitfulness and rebelliousness of my heart and a zeal for His glory and pity for poor perishing souls may lead me to work more faithfully in the Master's vineyard. Pray for the divine blessing upon my preaching, especially upon the poor sermon of next Sunday night. Dear Maria, do not fail to pray. What a precious pastor's heart. He took the work of the ministry very seriously. He saw his duty as a pastor as one of, one of sober implications for this life as well as the life to come. In the same period of ministry, Broadus was developing as a great preacher, very eloquent, very articulate, and very powerful. A small sample of his pulpit genius was evidenced when he was preaching on the ministry of the Apostle Paul from Acts 20. Listen to what he says. What a scene was that. This great and inspired man speaking to the people both publicly and from house to house, warning them with tears, telling them of God's amazing love and His tremendous wrath, of their guilt, their helpless condemnation, and the one way of salvation. Christians too, he warned, of the false teachers that should enter from without like grievous wolves into the fold that should rise up among themselves. He would weep as he entreated them to hold fast the truth as it is in Jesus, to adorn their profession, to live for the salvation of men and the glory of God. Thus night and day for three years he ceased not to warn everyone with tears. Why should not Paul weep and every creature and every Christian weep? See the condition of our fellow men, our friends, our kindred, as depicted not by our 
wild fancy or morbid fear, but by the calm teachings of the Word of God. They're condemned already. The wrath of God abideth on them. Their steps take hold on hell. Can we half realize what is meant by these fearful sayings and not weep? But worse, we tell them of the Savior who died that we might live and ever lives to save. We tell them of free pardon, of full salvation to every penitent believer in Him, of His redeeming love, His gracious invitations and precious promises. We tell of eternal bliss and eternal woe at their own imminent and increasing danger. We urge all that is terrible in God's wrath and all that is moving in His mercy. They look at us calmly. They turn away as unconcerned as though it were all a trifle or a dream. Oh, where is our pity? Where our love that we do not weep tears of blood? That we do not say with the psalmist, rivers of water run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law. It is well that the gospel induces tenderness since the preacher has to speak such awful truth. It is no light thing to look into the eyes of one you know and respect and love and charge him with being a vile sinner, charge selfishness and pride and pervading ungodliness upon what he accounts his best actions, to warn him of the wrath to come, to bid him tremble lest he receive deserved damnation, and reflect now what will be his unavailing remorse if in hell he should lift up his eyes being in torment. It is well that the gospel, which along with its promise of salvation to the believer, requires us to say, He that believeth not shall be damned. It is well that such a gospel should also inspire that feeling of tenderness, with which the painful duty ought to be performed. Those who heard him preach often observed that Broadus spoke as if he was speaking directly to each member of the congregation. It was as if he took each hearer into the inner circle of his confidence. He served as pastor for a season at Charlottesville Baptist Church and then was called to serve as a chaplain at the University of Virginia. It was a temporary work, a two-year term, as the chaplaincy rotated among the different denominations. He took the position at the insistence of J.B. Taylor and J.B. Jeter and made arrangements for an associate pastor to come and labor in the Char Charlottesville church, handling the preaching duties in his absence for the next two years. His term of chaplain was a time of great harvest and brought us, in reflecting upon it, was somewhat disappointed. He did not discover in the chaplaincy what he thought would, he would find in the way of an opportunity for increased theological study. He found the demands upon his time as great or greater than they had been in the pastorate. But his ministry as a chaplain was certainly not in vain, as evidenced by a situation that occurred when he was on a trip to Texas years later. This, re this record. While preaching in Texas, John Broadus was informed that a lady desired an interview with him. He made an appointment and she came, leading a little boy about 11 years of age by her side. She soon informed the doctor that her husband, now deceased, was a student in the University of Virginia when the preacher was a chaplain there. He was awakened and led to Christ through Broadus' sermons. The man was in the habit, before she became acquainted with him, of repeating many of the sentences of those sermons in his father's family. When they married, he would rehearse to her the thoughts that made such a deep impression on his mind. Since his death, the widow and mother had been teaching the preacher's words to the little boy. When Broadus was told this, in response later he said, the heart of a preacher might well melt in his bosom at the story. To think that your poor words, which you yourself had wholly forgotten, which you could never have imagined had vitality enough for that, had been repeated among strangers, repeated by the young man to his parents, repeated by the young widow to the child. Your poor words, thus mighty because they were God's truth you were trying to speak and because you had humbly sought God's blessing. When Broadus returned to the work of the ministry at Charlottesville, J.P. Boyce had recently finished at Princeton and become pastor at Columbia, South Carolina. William Williams, recently graduated from Harvard, assumed pastoral responsibilities in Alabama. Basil Manley, Jr., having studied at Newton and then at Princeton and having pastored in Alabama, had come to Richmond as pastor of the First Baptist Church there. The providential timing of God is intriguing because in 1857, the messengers of the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Louisville had appointed a committee to investigate the feasibility of establishing a theological seminary for Baptists in the South. This committee was made up of James P. Boyce, John A. Broadus, Basil Manley, Jr., E.T. Winkler, and William Williams. On February 15, 1858, Broadus received a letter from Manley 
The committee members had been assigned different responsibilities and were working on their respective assignments. And Manley was encouraging Broadus to pay him a visit. Manley's letter read in part, in speaking of the abstract of doctrines and principles, Manley's responsibility, by the way, was to, was to draft the abstract of principles. If you will come down, we can have a chat about our work committed to us, about that creed. It's an interesting way to describe it, isn't it? About the schedule of theological studies, etc. The two men did meet on May 1st, 1858. Southern Baptist held an educational convention in Greenville, South Carolina at that time. It was at this meeting that the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary was formally established. Decided the seminary would be located in Greenville, South Carolina. Also at this meeting that the four professors would be elected, J.P. Boyce, John Broadus, and Basil Manley, Jr. The fifth professor, A.M. Poindexter, was added shortly thereafter. John Broadus found himself once again in great straits as to what to do. When his congregation in Charlottesville became aware that he had been approached about the possibility of serving in the seminary, they were in a great uproar. They circulated a petition signed by many members of the church pleading with him to stay. That's a little different what some others have experienced. <laughs> and continue his pastoral labors. The pressure brought to bear upon Broadus by the congregation was great. Basil Manley Jr., however, brought his own brand of pressure in a letter which essentially said, if you refuse to go to the seminary, then it will fail. It will not come to pass. Here's an excerpt from that letter. So far as I can see, the real decision, whether or not there will be a seminary, rests with you. If you decline, I think Poindexter will. If he and you decline, I certainly shall. Then Winkler will feel unwilling to leave his church even if he could otherwise be induced to go. And even Boyce, left alone, will feel himself compelled to look rather cheerlessly for new associates. In the face of this letter, John Broadus still declined the opportunity and remained, the whole issue remained in limbo for about a year. Almost a year later, two letters came to Broadus from James P. Boyce, one dated March 29th, the other dated April 11th. The first letter informed Broadus that he was still being considered by the committee as professor of the seminary, that they were not willing to consider anyone else for the position. Broadus responded with a brief letter saying, in essence, if you will keep it completely under your hat and not tell anyone, I will consider, but this must not get out. Boyce responded immediately with another letter. Included was an extract from a letter that Basil Manley had written to Boyce. The prospects of the theological stool have been shaded at least by failing to obtain the officers we've sought and to commence business last fall. The trustees are to hold their first meeting in Richmond at the time of the approaching anniversary. Make another failure, and you will see what will come of it. Boyce then exhorted Broadus with the following challenge. If you cannot fully consent to a lifetime work, try it for a while in order to inaugurate the matter. Your simple name will be a tower of strength to us. When we are once started, if you find it not congenial, you can return to the pastorate. To this appeal, Broadus responded, If elected, I am willing to go. May God graciously direct and bless, and if I have erred in my judgment, may he overrule to the glory of his name. It was not long after this when John Broadus, Basil Manley, William Williams, and James P. Boyce were elected to the seminary. That Broadus and Manley received honorary doctorates from Richmond College. They were not as yet doctors of divinity, so Richmond College conferred these degrees upon them. One man wrote to Broadus stating, I see you have been doctored, and I want you to know I had nothing to do with it. Some were not very fond of the practice. Later, William and Mary College gave Broadus an honorary doctorate, and then many years later, while Broadus was speaking at the 250th anniversary of Harvard, he had yet another doctorate conferred upon him. Having come to a resolution of the matter concerning his willingness to teach at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Broadus' face was set like flint toward Greenville, South Carolina. He entered upon a labor that would consume his time and energies for the remaining 36 years of his life. The only intervals of his service to the seminary would be brought about by the ravages of war and his declining physical health. Even then, though, though physically hindered, his heart, mind, and soul were thoroughly invested in the advance of the gospel through the ministry of the seminary. When the seminary held its first commencement, May 28, 1860, it seemed that a bright future might lay ahead for the progress and prosperity of the institution except for one concern, the gathering storm clouds of war which hung on the horizon over the South. War between the North and South became increasingly inevitable. 
It's interesting to note that Broadus and Boyce were strong anti-secessionists. Secessionists, pardon me. And Manley was a mild secessionist. And Williams was a strong secessionist. The position of these men on that subject did not affect their fellowship, however, nor their common desire to see the seminary become a useful institution. When the southern states seceded from the Union, Broadus and the others determined to do all they could to aid the southern cause. If they could have gotten their way, they would have continued the operation of the seminary, but the provisional government of Jefferson Davis made it mandatory that all students, even theological students, resign their studies and go to war. Dr. Boyce became a chaplain in the Confederate Army, and the other professors tried to keep the seminary going, supporting themselves through supply preaching in various country churches. Dr. Broadus was approached and asked to write an evangelistic tract to be used among the soldiers in the Confederate Army. If you've not done much reading on this subject, by the way, uh, there's a, some excellent books out uh, by Sprinkle Publication, I think, that talk about the revival that took place in the armies of the South uh, during this time period. Broadus' tract was entitled, We Are Praying for You at Home. And I'll read a portion of it here because it gives you, again, the sense of his evangelistic heart. We pray for the cause, that just and glorious cause in which you so nobly struggle, that it may please God to make you triumphant, that we may have independence and peace. We know it must be hard for you amid the distractions of camp life, the alternate excitement and ennui, the absence of home influences and the associations of the sanctuary to fix mind and heart on things above. We do not doubt the nobleness of your impulses or the sincerity of your frequent resolutions to do right, nor do we exaggerate the temptations of a soldier's life. It is no reproach on your manliness and no assumption of superiority on our part to utter the mournful truth that spiritually man is always and everywhere weak, that you wrestle against outnumbering and overpowering spiritual foes. We pray that you may be inclined and enabled to commit your soul to the divine Savior who died to redeem us, ever lives to intercede for us, and who with yearning love is ever saying, Come unto me. We pray that the Holy Spirit may thoroughly change your heart, bringing you truly to hate sin and love holiness, may graciously strengthen you to withstand temptation, give you more and more the mastery over yourself and the victory over every enemy of your soul, whether it be appointed you to fall soon in battle or years hence to die at home. May God in mercy forbid that you should live in impenitence and die in your sins. Whether we are to sit with you again around our own fireside and take sweet counsel together as we walk to the house of God in company or are to meet you no more on earth, oh, may God in his mercy save us from an eternal separation. When General Stonewall Jackson was made aware of John Broadus' availability and his talent, he sent an urgent summons for Broadus to become a missionary to the Southern Army, which he did. He preached very effectively in the Confederate camp, and God gave him a harvest of souls, as was reported on several different occasions. There's a postscript to Broadus' years in the war between the states. It's important to add that in 1863, he returned to Greenville, and until 1866, he served as corresponding secretary to the Sunday School Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, a board that was established chiefly by the combined labors of Broadus and Manley. Now, unless you've been around a while, because all we know now is Lifeway, there was a time when everything published out of the Sunday School Board was published under the Broadman moniker from Broadus and Manley, a combination of their last names. When Broadus first came to the seminary, it was agreed that he would teach two new departments, New Testament interpretation in English and Greek and homiletics a course that John brought us entitled On the Preparation and Delivery of Sermons. The same title would later be given to his great work on homiletics. Not only had his teaching been interrupted by the war, but the financially hard times made it necessary for Broadus to take on pastorates, four of them now, of the Clear Spring Church, the Cedar Grove Church, the Williamston Church, all of these in 1863, and then in 1864 he added to that the Siloam Church. He had the great burden of four pastorates as well as the responsibility of trying to get the seminary going again. Broadus saw preaching as preeminent in training young men for the ministry. In his preparation and delivery of sermons, he made this statement about the importance of the preeminence of preaching. Quote, The great appointed means of spreading the good tidings of salvation through Christ is preaching, words spoken whether to the individual or to the assembly. And this nothing can supersede. Printing become a mighty agency for good and for evil, and Christians should employ it. 
with the utmost diligence and in every possible way for the spread of truth. But printing can never take the place of a living word. When a man who is apt in teaching, whose soul is on fire with the truth which he trusts has saved him and hopes will save others, speaks to his fellow men face to face, eye to eye, and the electric sympathies flash to and fro between him and his hearers till they lift each other up higher and higher until the intensest thought and the most impassioned emotion, higher and yet higher, till they are born as on chariots of fire above the world, there is a power to move men, to influence character, life, destiny, such as no printed page can ever possess. That's a pretty good description of preaching, isn't it? That, in, that engaging. It's wonderful. We have, we have tapes today. We have CDs. We have DVDs. But nothing replaces the real life engaging of pastor and people in the preaching moment. Broadus was a preacher's preacher, placed high value and great stock in the ministry of preaching. It came through in his seminary teaching, whether he was teaching homiletics or New Testament. In 1869, Dr. Broadus' health began to weaken severely, and two actions were taken by the Board of Trustees and the administration of the seminary in an effort to provide Broadus with some relief. First, Dr. Crawford, Crawford Howell Toy was elected to the faculty. This allowed Dr. Manley to give over some of his responsibilities to Dr. Toy, and Dr. Manley, in turn, took up some of Dr. Broadus's responsibilities. Second, Broadus was encouraged to travel abroad. For one full year, he traveled throughout Europe. It was thought that this would afford him opportunities of increasing health, as well as expand and further his scholarship. A.T. Robertson records this of Broadus's visit with Charles Spurgeon. When he visited the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, he had this to say, quote, I was greatly delighted with Spurgeon especially with his conduct of public worship. The whole thing, house, congregation, order, worship, preaching, was as nearly up to my ideal as I ever expect to see in this life. Of course, Mr. Spurgeon has his faults and deficiencies, but he is a wonderful man. Then he further observed, then he preaches the real gospel, and God blesses him. He went to Geneva, to the land of John Calvin, at Geneva, I made some effort one afternoon to find places associated with Calvin, and it was curious to see how little could be found. An admirer of Calvin, and, and assuredly I belong to that class, might liken the case to that of Christianity itself, whose original abodes have long been occupied by its enemies, leaving few genuine memorials beyond the mere natural locality, but which thus only the more vindicates its character as not local and sensuous." Sometime after Broadus had returned from Europe, it became evident that the seminary had to move in order to survive. In June of 1877, it was decided the seminary would relocate to Louis Louisville, Kentucky. And the wisdom of this was seen by the fact that the largest number of students who had ever been enrolled at Greenville was 67. In the opening session at Louisville, there were 88 students. May the 10th, 1879 marked a sad day in the history of the seminary, however. Dr. Crawford Howell Toy had been steadily embracing the views of higher criticism. He'd begun to call into question the inspiration and authority of the Scriptures. As a result of this, it became necessary for him to resign from the seminary. This event devastated both Broadus and Boyce. They said that their young jewel was gone. Yet these men place such a high value on truth and believe that we are called of God to buy the truth and sell it not that they were willing to put on a train to nowhere one of their dearest friends, rather than keep him and compromise the gospel at that institution. Such convictions need to be revived today. In 1883, Dr. Broadus was perhaps at the height of his career. Through his untiring labor, the seminary had become the recipient of considerable endowments, and he was gaining a reputation for himself as a consummate theological scholar. In addition, to Anglo-Saxon, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, he had added a proficiency in German, French, Spanish, Italian, Gothic, Coptic, and modern Greek. He'd made himself a specialist in homiletics, in the English Bible, in New Testament history, exegesis, in Greek, in textual criticism, in patristic Greek, in hymnology, English and foreign. His preparation and delivery of sermons, which had appeared in 1870, had become the standard and most popular work on the subject of homiletics. June 27, 1884, the faculty of Southern Seminary sent birthday greetings to Charles Haddon Spurgeon on his 50th birthday, a portion of which stated, 
The undersigned professors in the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary beg leave to offer respectful and hearty congratulations on your 50th birthday. Especially we delight to think how nobly you have defended and diffused the doctrines of grace. How in an age so eager for novelty and marked by such loosening of belief, you have through long years kept the English-speaking world for your audience while never turning aside from the old-fashioned gospel. In 1887, the seminary professor's life had reached a frenzied pitch as more and more people called for his services. He was in demand as pulpit supply, interim pastor, and would spend his summers filling the pastorates in New York and New Jersey. Constant demands were on his time. People were writing him all the time, wanting information, requesting his services, inviting him to attend various meetings to preach. His commentary on Matthew appeared that year and was hailed as the best of its kind on the Gospel of Matthew. Annie Armstrong wrote him from Baltimore, pleading with him to make available his Baptist catechism for supplemental Sunday school material. Given the theological bent of Broadus's catechism, one cannot help but wonder what Annie Armstrong's own theological convictions might have been. In 1889, the man who did not seek prominence or position found himself shouldered with the responsibility of serving the seminary as its president. The honor came to him in a most grievous way, however, as his dearest friend in all of life, Dr. James P. Boyce, had passed away December 28, 1888. This was a great blow to Broadus. And he wrote to Basil Manley saying, I shall be constantly needing your advice about measures and men, about great things and small. Now that Boyce is gone, I value your advice in seminary matters beyond that of all other men. Yet the providence of God, he only had 13 months to lean on him. On January 31st, 1892, Basil Manley passed away, the same day that Charles Spurgeon had died in England. The end was drawing near for Broadus himself. He knew that his health was failing. Increasingly, he needed to take long trips to the spring, to springs for the water that seemed to arrest his condition. He developed heart disease, and it proved to be the beginning of the end. After an attack of pleurisy on Friday, March the 8th, John Broadus came to the end of the course. Having fought a good fight, having kept the faith, he died on Saturday, March 16th, 1895. Ten days prior to his death, he had managed to attend his New Testament class and lecture. Listen to his parting words, the last words his students heard him say. Young gentlemen, if this were the last time I should ever be permitted to address you, I would feel amply repaid for consuming the whole hour and endeavoring to impress upon you these two things. These are very interesting in the light of this conference. These two things, true piety and like Apollos, to be men mighty in the scriptures. The labors of John Broadus were many and mighty, and they left their mark indelibly upon Southern Baptists of succeeding generations, whether we know it or not. Well, what about his legacy? It's perhaps best viewed from the vantage point of his theology and his personal example. Rightly undertaken, such a view would give a clear portrait of Broadus' applied theology. His theology was in the mainstream of Reformed thought, being thoroughly Baptistic and unashamedly Calvinistic in his understanding of biblical Christianity. Some nine months after he had graduated from the University of Virginia, John wrote to his uncle, Reverend Andrew Broadus, asking him, quote, how far should Calvinism be carried? His uncle replied, I know but little about isms and desire to know nothing among the people but Jesus Christ and him crucified. My plan has been, since I've been in the ministry, to avoid as much as possible all controversy on religious subjects. In this course, I have enjoyed, no doubt, far more peace of mind than I should have done had I been a controversialist. It is a point well settled in my mind that God always acts in accordance with an eternal purpose, else how can many portions of His world be reconciled, of His Word be reconciled. I'm also well convinced that Christ and the apostles in their appeals to mankind recognized no impediment in the way of any, but called upon all men everywhere to repent. Now, because I cannot fathom the mystery connected with God's sovereignty and man's accountability, I must not run into fatalism as some do. But the safe plan in my judgment is that of Christ and His apostles alluded to above. Broadus managed to follow the advice of his uncle and, and hold to his solid biblical orthodoxy and yet avoid major controversies in his life. When he did find himself involved in controversy, it was more often than not by virtue of his association with James P. Boyce. Broadus had a high degree of respect for the theology of John Calvin, Francis Turretin, Charles Hodge, John Dagg, James Boyce. 
Concerning Calvin and Turretin, he said this, quote, Several great departments of system, systematic theology seem to me more thoroughly discussed and luminously stated by Turretin's noble work than by any other of the great theologians. The people who sneer at what is called Calvinism might as well sneer at Mont Blanc. He wrote this when he was in Europe looking at the Alps, and Mont Blanc was the tallest peak in the Alps, some three miles high. He also said, We're not in the least bound to defend all of Calvin's opinions or actions, but I don't see how anyone who really understands the Greek of the Apostle Paul or the Latin of Calvin and Turretin can fail to see that these latter did but interpret and formulate substantially what the former teaches. Concerning Francis Turretin's treatise on theology, Broadus said, For one who sympathizes with what we call the Calvinistic or Augustinian type of theology, this work is in certain important respects unrivaled. And though Broadus himself never studied under Charles Hodge, he had a great respect for the Princeton professor's theology. Broadus also recognized what a privilege it had been for Boyce and Manley to have studied under Hodge, and he said, quote, it's a great privilege to be directed and upborne by such a teacher in studying that exalted system of Pauline truth, which is technically called Calvinism, which compels an earnest student to profound thinking, and when pursued with a combination of systematic thought and fervent experience, makes him at home among the most inspiring and ennobling views of God and of the universe he has made. Broadus also had a great degree of admiration for John Dagg and his writings. John Dagg was the first writing uh, Southern Baptist theologian. He said of Dagg, Dr. Dagg was a man of great ability and a lovable character. His works are worthy of thorough study, especially his small volume, A Manual of Theology, which is remarkable for clear statement of the profoundest truths and for devotional sweetness. Broadus went on to say that after toiling much in his early years as a pastor over Knapp and Turretin, Dwight and Andrew Fuller, and other elaborate theologians, he found this manual of theology by Dag a real delight, feeling all through his life the pleasing impulse it gave to the theological inquiry and, and reflection. Of course, he had great esteem for James P. Boyce, his dearest friend on the earth, and fellow laborer in the gospel, his counselor and his instructor. He said of Dr. Boyce's class in systematic theology, you had to know your systematic theology or you could not recite it to Boyce. And though the young men were generally rank Arminians when they came to the seminary, few went through this course under him without being converted to his strong Calvinistic views. Concerning Boyce's abstract of systematic theology, Broadus said, Dr. Boyce's work is indeed thoroughly in accordance with the system of theological opinion commonly called Calvinism. This is believed by many of us to be really the teaching of the Apostle Paul, as elaborated by Augustine and systematized and defended by Calvin. It is a body of truth that compels men to think, in itself a great advantage. The objections to it are believed to grow out of either misapprehension or misapplication through wrong inferences. Men assume predestination and election and then deny human freedom and responsibility. Or they assume human freedom and accountability and then deny predestination and election. In either case, because they cannot fully reconcile these two sides of theological truth, thus making our capacity to harmonize things, listen to this now, making our capacity to harmonize things the limit of possible truth and the criterion of Scripture interpretation. The world of matter is kept in equilibrium by the antagonism of physical forces, and the world of truth in like manner through countervailing facts, countervailing facts and principles. Whatever theoretical position may be held, no truly devout man actually lives in practical neglect of either divine sovereignty or human responsibility. It's important to recognize the terminology he's using here. He's not pitching divine sovereignty and free will against one another. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility or divine sovereignty and human accountability. He says no one really lives uh, neglecting one or the other of these. The blindest hard shell who has no message to the unconverted does not neglect to plow his corn. The most ultra and heated Arminian believes in the doctrines of grace whenever he grows earnest in prayer. Speaking again on the abstract of systematic theology, Broadus said, It is designed as a textbook for classes, it is in like manner well suited to careful private study. Nothing is more useful to a thoroughgoing student than to take some first class book on a great subject and master it completely, chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph, so that he can state the exact line of thought in any portion to himself or to some patiently sympathetic friend. If now, to Boyce's abstract, a minister will add such a copious work as strong systematic theology, 
He will possess a very admirable theological apparatus and both works from American Baptists. Commenting on the value of Dr. Boyce's tracts and the printed sermons, Broadus said, one of, the special, one of special interest to ministers treats, quote, the value of a complete and accurate knowledge of the doctrines of grace to the successful preaching of the gospel. Now, Broadus was not simply an admirer of the doctrines of others. He admired the theology of these men because he himself embraced these same convictions. This can be demonstrated exegetically, catechetically, and homiletically. Exegetically, his commitment to the doctrines of grace can be seen through his commentary on Matthew's gospel. Catechetically, this same commitment comes through in his catechism of Bible teaching. And then homiletically, the same commitment can be demonstrated from an excerpt or two from his printed sermons and addresses. It was predicted by some that brought us his commentary on Matthew would probably become the chief commentary in the American commentary set. Let's consider his comments on several verses from Matthew 11, beginning with verse 25, which states, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, Broadus observes. It is the sovereign of the universe that does this. Who shall hesitate to acknowledge that what he does is right? Verse 26 reads, Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, Broadus commented. Our Lord acknowledges the propriety of the sovereign Father's course and praises him for it. Whatever pleases God ought to please us. Verse 27 reads, All things are delivered unto me by my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Brought us commented. At some time past, perhaps when the covenant of redemption was formed in eternity, all things were committed to him. Then speaking of the vanity of men in trying to come to God on their own, Brought us said, all their wisdom and intelligence will not avail to gain a true knowledge of the Father unless the Son chooses to reveal Him to them. And then verse 28, which reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Broadus made these observations. Notice how the invitation follows immediately upon the statement that no one knows the Father but the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son chooses to reveal Him. To his mind, the mind of Jesus, there was no contradiction between sovereign electing grace and the free invitations of the gospel. Concerning the purpose of Christ's death, brought us considered the substitutionary nature of the atonement and also the specific design of Christ's death when commenting on Matthew 20, 28, which states, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Here's brought us. The preposition rendered for necessarily means instead of, involving substitution, a vicarious death. When objectors require us to prove otherwise that Christ's death was vicarious, then it's well to remember that here and also in Mark, the preposition is anti, which no one can possibly deny to have and necessarily the meaning instead of. Christ's atoning death made it compatible with the divine justice that all should be saved if they would accept it on that ground. And in that sense, he gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2.6. He tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2.9. But his death was never expected nor divinely designed actually to secure the salvation of all. And so in the sense of specific purpose, he came, quote, to give his life a ransom for many, sufficient for all, Broadus says, effectual for many. Brought us also recognized the biblical balance needed in properly addressing the divine side and human side of salvation when he was commenting on Matthew 22, 14, for many are called but few are chosen. This selection or this choosing of the actually saved may be looked at from two sides. From the divine side, we see the scriptures teach an eternal election of men to eternal life, simply out of God's good pleasure. There you have unconditional eternal election. From a human side, we see that those persons attain the blessings of salvation through Christ who accept the gospel invitation and obey the gospel commandment. It is doubtful whether our minds can combine both sides in a single view, but we must not for that reason deny either of them to be true. The few who are chosen give proof of it, of their having been chosen, by accepting the call and behaving accordingly. These enjoy the feast of salvation, gladly honor the Son of God, and humbly ascribe all to sovereign grace. Like most Baptists of his day, brought us also recognized the proper understanding of a appreciation for predestination was critical to a proper understanding of the perseverance and preservation of the saints. So these two doctrines were tied together in, in several uh, good sermons. 
in the catechism. Protestant's catechism is replete with his commitment to the doctrines of grace. Just a few questions and answers will demonstrate this. Does God act according to the purposes formed beforehand? God has always intended to do whatever he does. What is Christ doing for us now? Christ dwells in his people, intercedes for them, and controls all things for their good. What was Christ's chief work as Savior? Christ died and rose again for his people. What is meant by the word regeneration? Regeneration is God's causing a person to be born again. Does faith come before the new birth? No, it is the new heart that truly repents and believes. Does God give his renewing spirit as he sees proper? Yes, God gives his renewing spirit to those whom he always purposed to save. And then homiletically. Broadus delivered an address in 1874 to the students at Southern Seminary on the American Baptist Ministry of A.D. 1774. It's a 100th centennial celebration. He said in that address, The great scripture doctrines of depravity, atonement, and regeneration were almost unknown to many of their hearers and disputed by many others. And so the preacher felt called continually to preach these and the related doctrines, proving and enforcing them by generous quotations from the text of scripture. Whenever men ceased to preach these great doctrines of the Bible, drawing them directly from the fountainhead, believing something definite, knowing what they believe and why they believe it, and how to prove it from the inspired word, then the pulpit soon loses its power. Broadus was adamant in his desire to demonstrate that the doctrines of grace do not promote complacency. In a sermon from Romans 9, 3, he entitled, Intense Concern for the Salvation of Others, Broadus said this, Concern for the salvation of others is not prevented by a belief in what we call the doctrines of grace. It is not prevented by believing in divine sovereignty and predestination and election. Many persons intensely dislike the ideas which are expressed by these phrases. Many persons shrink away from ever accepting them because those ideas are in their minds associated with the notion of stolid indifference. They say if predestination be true, then it follows that a man cannot do anything for his own salvation that if he is to be saved, he will be saved, and he has nothing to do with it, and need not care, nor need anyone else care. Now, this does not at all follow, and I will prove that it does not follow, by the fact that Paul himself, the great oracle of this doctrine in the Scripture, has uttered these words of burning, passionate concern for the salvation of others, so close by the passages in which he has taught the doctrines in question. Broadus continued in a compelling way to show how Paul had taught previously in Romans 8 that whom he did predestinate, them he also called. He cited a subsequent passage in Romans 9 that teaches, quote, Jacob I have loved and Esau I hated. Broadus then stated, look, here they are. And Paul said in the midst of this, I want to see my brethren saved. Broadus suggested the difficulty with these passages comes when men in many cases draw unwarranted emphases from the teachings of the Bible and then cast all the odium of those inferences upon the truths from which we draw them. A word needs to be said about Broadus's doctrine of the church. He wrote a pamphlet entitled, The Duty of Baptists to Teach Their Distinctive Views. He said in that quote, We hold the Christian church ought to consist only of persons making a credible profession of conversion, of faith in Christ, maintaining that none should be received as church members unless they give credible evidence of conversion. We also hold in theory that none should be retained in membership who do not lead a godly life. That if a man fails to show his faith by works, he should cease to make profession of faith. Some of our own people appear at times to forget that strict church discipline is a necessary part of the Baptist view as to church membership. Let me just quickly draw some lessons now, having sketched out the life of Broadus for you and his labors and his legacy. First, we see from him the importance of being balanced in our theology. You read Broadus' sermons and addresses, he makes a very balanced approach. Brethren, these doctrines we love must never appear to be the be-all, end-all. They are, as I've described to some in my worldview, they're the Terminate Stay Resident Program. They're running behind the scenes all the time. They filter and affect everything that we do, everything we preach, everything we teach. Don't let somebody bully you into thinking that if you're not getting up preaching on one or more of these five points on Sundays, you're not preaching the truth. Preach Christ and Him crucified. 
Preach the whole counsel of God. Inevitably, you will deal with these matters. If Broadus was anything, he was balanced. His understanding of these doctrines was wed nicely with his passion to see sinners come to faith in Christ. It doesn't matter if that appears contradictory to some. You know, someone asked Spurgeon one time if he would reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility, and he said, of course not. I never reconcile friends. Be balanced in your ministry. Second, we need to learn that we ought to be faithful in our labor where we are, bloom where we're planted. It's fascinating to me in this day of, of denominational positioning and ladder climbing. Broadus never sought anything like that. His greatest desire was to be found faithful. To hear at the end, well done, good and faithful servant. Every now and then, or perhaps for Tom more often, I don't get these calls so much anymore, but you get these contacts of folks saying, I want to, I want, want to pastor a founder's church that's come through Reformation. We are reformed and always reforming. In fact, when someone asks me, are you a reformed Baptist? I say, no, I'm a reforming historic Southern Baptist. And I suspect I will be till I die. Bloom where you're planted. Don't let the devil lie to you and suggest to you that, that, that some other place will be better. Oftentimes, and I know that sometimes it can't be helped, you're, you're being ejected from your pulpits, driven out by people. But when you can bloom where you're planted, uh, you'll at least be dealing with knowns and not exchanging them for a set of unknowns. Don't let people tell you that you, it's important that you just fly under the radar, get into some position and opportunity for greater usefulness. So look, if God taps you for that, wonderful. Seize upon it. Use it for His glory. But don't buy into that stuff that seems to sweep across our denomination today. Third, be personable. Broadus was a winsome man. Listen to this story. When he died, a Jewish rabbi in Louisville said of him, When I learned to know and revere in Broadus a Christian, my concept of Christianity and my attitude toward it underwent a complete change. Brought us was the precious fruit by which I learned to judge the tree of Christianity. What do people know of Christianity from knowing us? What do they know of Christ from knowing us? Brethren, the doctrines we teach and preach are hard enough. We don't need to add our personality quirk edges to those. Be personable. Be tender. I still don't think that the world is ready for a Calvinist who weeps over souls. Nor do I think the world has seen enough of that. Brought us out of sanctified congeniality. We should pray for the same. Fourth, always maintain fervor for the souls of the lost. It is sad that I have, I've met some men along the way. And I'll confess to probably having been one of them at one time. That coming to grips with these doctrines stunted evangelistic fervor and zeal. Now, there is a transition time when you begin to see the Scriptures teaching on these things. But I'm going to tell you, if the cage stage has lasted longer than six months to a year for you and you've lost your zeal to share the gospel and you don't intentionally go to share the gospel, throw in the garbage this theology you have and go back to the scriptures and learn it from the scriptures. Because the people in the scriptures who taught these things most fervently burned themselves out 
for the souls of men and the glory of God. Brought us, as we've shown you in some snapshots, always was fervent for souls. Whether a teacher at University of Virginia witnessing to Lottie Moon, writing a Confederate tract, preaching as a missionary to the Confederate armies, preaching in his pastor, teaching his students, wherever. He was on the path of souls. I'll give you one example. He wrote in a student's autograph book as they signed them, I guess at the end of their university days, one thing thou lackest. This young man was not a Christian. Years later from Texas, there came a letter from Dr. P.M. Matthews to John Broadus saying, you may not even remember that years ago you wrote in my autograph book, one thing thou lackest. I want you to know I've found that thing. And then finally, make preaching central to your ministry. Never apologize for making the preaching of the gospel central to your times of worship. You're aware that there's a movement afoot that wants to turn this sacred desk and this sacred responsibility into something more like a Dave Letterman top ten list. to jollify people, to give them what their itching ears want to hear. Stand your ground, brethren. Preach the word. The people have come to be fed. Feed them the word of God. Brought us said it this way, when delivering the Lyman Beecher lectures at Yale in 18, 1889. For the most part, our hope of usefulness in the world is through you. Preach your best before God for your own sakes. And then think of us and preach a little better still. You're at a Founders Conference. A conference on the faith of the Founders of the Southern Baptist Convention. When you go back to your pulpits this Sunday, and the various labors God gives you, whether standing behind lectern to teach or pulpit to preach, preach your very best before God for your own sake. You'll give account of that one day. And once you've done that, then think of Broadus and Boyce and Manley and Dag and Mel, those who've gone before, those upon whose shoulders we stand and preach a little better still. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, We just again thank you for the life and the labors of men of God who've gone before, meteors shooting across the sky of history. Fathers, we're not, we're not here to honor uh, the tombs of the prophets or to worship them. But we're here because as best we know our hearts, we want to be found faithful at the end. And we know that we're not the original thinkers on these matters, that we stand in a long line of dear brethren who knew you and who manifested that in remarkable and incredible ways. And we're thankful for those who have chronicled these things so that we can read biographies and have our, our hearts warmed and our minds challenged and our lives scrutinized. And Lord, as we leave here, 
We don't desire to go out and make a name for ourselves so that somebody will write a biography about us. We want to make a name for you and are willing with Whitfield to say, let our names perish into oblivion. If the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will simply be exalted. I thank you for these brethren. I pray your blessings upon everyone here, this dear church. Oh God, continually increase the intensity of the gospel witness from this church. That this area might burn brightly. Send revival fires, we pray. Take these brethren who will go back to pulpits this Lord's Day, some that are very difficult, and re-energize them to preach the gospel. These students who are doing their best to study to show themselves approved unto God, may their training equip them for the work of the ministry. We thank you for the privilege of preaching the gospel. We thank you for the privilege of being in such a fellowship, such a fraternal of brethren who love your truth. And thank you for the time you've let us be together in these few hours, these last few days. We make our prayer in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.